Uh, good, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to everyone who's with us this morning to worship on this Christmas Sunday morning. And we bid a warm welcome to you, especially if you're someone who's here or maybe you're someone who's just back home already for Christmas. So I expect maybe most of the home for Christmas people will be another few days before they arrive on these shores. But it's great to have you here. This is our Lessons and Carol service this morning. So a lot of the service will follow through unannounced uh, from really after, the, after I introduce the first reading uh, right through to the offering that will all come unannounced. Uh, so you can follow the, the details on your order of service. The details of the service are there. And on the back, just the few announcements we have this morning. So we're back to, to Carl's this evening, but on a, with a slightly different twist to them. Uh, we're having a Christmas celebration this evening. So slightly different style of music and again, some reading. So if you're saying, hold on, six lessons, aren't there nine lessons in Carl's? Well, there's four more lessons this evening and four more Carl's and some music from the, the singers as well. So please do join us tonight at half past six, and please also plan, stay afterwards, there's a cup of tea, coffee, mince pies, shortbread, that's all happening this evening uh, after our evening worship, our evening celebration. Um, the other thing's just to keep you abreast of what's happening over the Christmas New Year period, you will see there that Christmas Day, which of course is next Sunday, we meet at the earlier time of, of 10.30, as we usually do on Christmas Day, for our, our, our time of um, family worship and uh, generally a shorter service than we would have on a, on a typical Sunday. And then the following week, which is New Year's Day, we have just the one service again then, but at the usual time of 11.30 on New Year's Day. Therefore, January Communion this year is not until the 8th of January because sometimes we have it earlier when it falls a little bit later into the new year, but because New Year's Day is the first of, uh, it, is, it would be the typical communion Sunday, we're not until the 8th. You'll also see that uh, though there are no midweek meetings for prayer and Bible study this week or next, we do, are then beginning the new year with a special time of prayer. I thought this was what we should do right at the start of the new year. So I've set up a, a series of five times there, uh, first, sorry, six five times for prayer from Wednesday the 4th to Sunday the 8th at different times of day. So two of them are in the evenings, one of them's mid-morning, and the others at the weekend are earlier in the morning. Uh, and hopefully that means that even if you can't get to all of those, there's a time there that will suit you to come and be part of seeking God's blessing and God's will for the new year as a congregation as we move forward in the Lord's work into 2023. The other thing we mentioned this time of the year, of course, is the uh, our giving. Uh, again, you'll see details there about the giving for 2022. So if there's any amounts of money, whether it's for free will offering or, or United Appeal or for uh, the uh, work of the building fund, whatever it would be, uh, you need to have that in by the 15th of January if you want it included in the 2022 year. Otherwise, it'll, it'll, it'll go into the following year. And you also see as an invitation there, if you're a taxpayer and haven't already signed a gift aid declaration whereby the church can claim back the, the, the tax on your giving, then we'd love you to do that and think about it. And you can speak to, to Gareth, the treasurer, or to Paul Johnson, who looks after the, the gift aid, if you want to be part of that. The other thing just to say is, to th I think it's important to say that we thank you for your giving throughout this year as a congregation. Uh, and you'll be, when you receive your new offering envelopes, as many of you will receive in the next, if you haven't already got them this past week, you'll receive them over the next couple of weeks uh, as the elders call with you. You will receive with them this little update on the refurbishment of the building here. And it's really, really encouraging because while the outlaw, outlay in the renovation of the church, including all the fees involved, came to about a million pounds. We're at the situation now where we've been able, uh, following a recent decision of committee, to pay off another bit of the debt. We're back, we're down to about 120,000. So that's really good since, since 2018. That's excellent. So we want to commend you for that and thank you for your generosity and just encourage you to continue in that spirit of generosity. And uh, we trust in a, a relatively short time we'll be able to clear the rest of that. So that's all of our announcements. We, well, sorry, well, sorry, one more, two more things. Uh, these books are being given out 
when the elders call visiting you at the end of the year, they'll be bringing you a little gift of a book, uh, the ultimate Christmas wish list. But if you're here this morning, you're a visitor and wouldn't be maybe receiving a, uh, that visit from your district elder, there's a book for you. Uh, there's some of them left and they're on the hall table. If you want to take one of those little books, the ultimate Christmas wish list, please do. They're free for you to take. One other thing, and this is something that's been sitting in my a pulpit here for several weeks. Here are a set of keys. <laughs> Two keys, I think they're the same, and the number on them is 152. Now, these mysteriously turned up on our kitchen table <laughs> about a month and more ago, but they turned up the day after the, the coffee morning in November, which, which we held in support of Bethany's work over in the church hall. And the only thing we could think is that they, they, they ended up being gathered up with stuff that day. So if anybody's lost a, a keys with a yellow little key ring on them, Please do ask me about them because they've been sitting here for weeks, So just so you know, okay? We come to worship the Lord this morning. And we, in the prophecy of Jeremiah, hear these words. These are words, in fact, we looked at in detail at our midweek Bible study a, a couple of weeks back. But here's, the, here's a prophecy through Jeremiah of the coming Savior, the Son of David. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. We come to praise the name of our Lord this morning, therefore, in our first Christmas carol, once in royal David's city. <laughs>
loving and gracious God, we come with hearts adoring you today, that we realize that in love and in mercy, you have sent forth your only son to be our savior. He who was the darling of heaven, crowned with glory and honor, humbled himself to become like one of us, to take our likeness to be tempted in every way as we are, and yet through all of this temptation and trial to remain without sin, <coughs> to remain the sinless son of God. And in that condition of sinlessness to bear our sins to the cross of Calvary. Therefore, as the prophet of old said, we today may claim him as the Lord our righteousness. We do not have righteousness within ourselves. Sin is the marked condition of our lives and is our habitual choice by human nature. <laughs> but we bless you today that through Jesus Christ, we have one who gives a new nature to sinners, gives a new heart and a new desire, a desire to glorify and honor you the living God and we thank you that in coming to him we find pardon for our sins that are many we find peace with God which we need because we are rebels against God and more than that we receive the we are credited with the gift of his righteousness even though we have none of our own and therefore, as that Carl has pointed us to the day when Christ would come a second time in his glory to judge the world, we who are Christ's know that on that day of judgment, we will stand redeemed, forgiven, right with God, <coughs> heirs of eternal life, filled with the hope an assurance of glory, not because we've earned it, but because Christ has done all for us. He is indeed the Lord, our righteousness. May we today, therefore, responding to your word, be reminded that this season of the year is not just a time to look back and wonder at what happened at Bethlehem but a time to look forward and realize that our Savior will appear again in the clouds. He will appear in his glory and he will come to bring his people unto himself. In that final day of resurrection, the living and the dead who are his will be brought to that fullness of eternal life in glory with him. What a tragedy, Lord, if we should miss that because we love our sin too much and we're unwilling to follow the Savior who gave himself for us. Speak therefore in this time of worship today through every reading of scripture that points us to Christ 
and tells us of his love for us and cause our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit to turn to him, to respond in faith and love to him and to walk with him in every day ahead that you give us until the day you come our call. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <coughs> our first lesson this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 11 and will be read by Adam McCurdy. <coughs> Isaiah 11, 1 to 10. The branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his root, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He will breath, breathe of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The, wolf, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat the straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hands into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my own holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Yeah. 
Micah 5, 1-5a The ruler to be born in Bethlehem. And he muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With the rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Epathera, who are too little to be among the clans of Judea, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labour has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of, and the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Thank mm -hmm.
21 verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. But Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared before him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to your son, and you are to call him Jesus, because he will save his people from sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to your son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage <coughs> until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus.
Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke chapter 2 verse 8 to 20 and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night and lo the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were so afraid and the angel unto them fear not for behold I bring you tidings of great joy which shall be 
to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and the earth peace, good will towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were go gone away from with them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. And see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And then they had say, seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they had heard it wondered at those things which was which were told them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14 say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him, he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made for him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and when we have seen his glory, glory is not, um, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you. 
so much. I, I want to thank everybody who's been taking part in our service this morning to our readers, Abby, Raymond, Pauline, Anne, Callum and Matthew. And then those who've been leading the praise. It's great to have the choir back with us. Back with five new members, I think I've counted. There's still room for more, so just to speak to the music director. He'd gladly welcome you in and uh, get you tuned up and into, uh, into action. Thank you to every one of you. And thank you, Sam, for making the effort with over these last few weeks to get everything ready for today has been excellent. We really enjoyed it. Now, we all gave Caleb a big round of applause because he sang so well earlier on. But I think they would do, they could do with one as well. Do you think so? Yeah. So 
So let's do come back tonight. There's more praise this evening. I said in a different slide, we've got a new, we also got a new praise band together. So they'll be leading this Christmas celebration this evening. And so we've got our drums, our guitars, everything else. All those things are all happening tonight. So please come back and join us at half past six for a different style of carol service. Okay, we're going to bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord just now. as we bring these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and for the extension of gospel and ministry and outreach here in this congregation and across the world we thank you lord even looking back on a year that's been for everything that's been accomplished for the sake of the gospel of christ whether it's been in the work of this congregation or much further afield in ireland and throughout the world we bless you lord for every servant of yours answering your call and being supported by the giving of your people. And we especially remember again uh, those who are laboring in areas where it is difficult. Difficult because there is opposition and persecution. Difficult because simply there is great spiritual darkness. Areas where Christ's name is not known. And yet we thank you for those who are seeking to make him known and to plant new churches in new areas of our world. We remember too, Lord, uh, at this time particularly the people of Israel, to whom you first came uh, in person many years ago, and who even yet have not fully realized their need of the Messiah, their Savior, Jesus Christ. Come and do a work of salvation amongst them, we pray. Then we come and turn and bring our own needs and thoughts as a family and of, of, of a, out in the church and in our homes before you. As we move into this Christmas season, we pray that we will not lose sight of the one who is central to it all, our Saviour Jesus Christ, but will find great joy in celebrating his birth and his great salvation. And yet we're mindful, Lord, of those for whom this Christmas will pose a, a challenge and a difficulty where the shadow of bereavement lies over a home, where there's a battle with illness and other struggles with the, that life presents to us that perplex us and cause stress and anxiety in these days. Lord, may we who need you and need to know the wonder of the Prince of Peace meeting our need, may we experience it this season. May he who is the, the, the light of the world and the Prince of Peace be the one who guards in the hearts and minds of those who are troubled at this time. We also look to you, Lord, to uh, Bless in, in our homes and families, especially as people would travel home to join us at Christmas time. We grant, pray you'll grant your mercies and 
safe travel to those who are coming this way. And even despite all the disruption and disputes and strikes and everything else, we pray that uh, at this time, families will be joined together again <coughs> in the joy that they, they share when they come together. May this season of the year be one of great gladness and of great love, especially when we focus on the love of Jesus who gave himself for us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing again before we come to a short message from the word, as with gladness, men of old. Papers carried the story of a nine page document recently issued by the University of Brighton on the subject of using inclusive language and avoiding anything that might possibly give offence. So, among the several pieces of advice offered was a recommendation as to how they should speak about the upcoming holiday period. No, you mustn't refer to it as the Christmas closure period, but rather as the winter closure period. The reason given that the term Christmas was too Christian centered, too focused on Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there was no concern whatever that the Christians might possibly be offended by that. But I guess in these days of political correctness, we're no longer surprised by that kind of nonsense. But the English evangelist and Christian writer, J. John, 
took up the matter in a short letter he wrote to the Times this week, and he made this comment. Our calendars are full of mem memorials to unpleasant pagan gods and dubious emperors that I find offensive. Could we please see moves to eradicate such names as Wednesday? Because Wednesday derives from the god Woden, or Odin, an ancient Norse god. Or how about July, that is named in honor of the Roman emperor, Julius Caesar? Perhaps we should get rid of those as well. Now, J. John, of course, was speaking tongue in cheek, but the point he makes is a good one. That when the language police set out to correct us on how we should speak, the only religion that really needs to be silenced, according to them, is Christianity. Even to a ridiculous extent of deleting the word Christmas. We could get upset about such things, but I think we shouldn't. Rather, we should come back to John's Gospel, chapter 1, and there understand that in reality nothing has changed since the day that Jesus Christ took human flesh as the baby born to Mary in the town of Bethlehem. Jesus writes about this, uh, uh, sorry, John writes about the one who was the living word, the son of God. And he says this at verse nine uh, through to 11 of chapter one of his gospel. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. What John tells us of there is of a savior who was sidelined. And sending his son to take human flesh, God was doing something the world desperately needed. He was addressing the need of a world darkened and damaged and depraved by the curse of human sin. Sin of every kind. Sin that is obvious, ugly and brutal. Sin that is secret, hidden in our hearts. Sin that is subtle but is deeply self-centered and corrupting of the human soul. Many of us, I would say today in church, would say our sins are not ugly and brutal, but they're nonetheless real and deeply self-centered <coughs> and corrupting our hearts and our minds. We sin in our thought life, we sin in the words we speak and in the things we do. Yet we consider our sins to have a respectability that others don't have. Whose sins are scandalous, notorious. But for everyone in this world, this world darkened by the shadow of sin, God in his son was sending light. Light that on the one hand, would reveal our sin for what it is, but on the other hand, was also capable of dispelling our darkness and sin from our whole being. And that's what we see in the course of John's gospel. In Jesus' words in John 8 verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There is the Savior who delivers people from sin and the darkness, the destruction that it brings. On the other hand, in John chapter 3, we read of the other side of the coin, as it were, of what is more commonly the reaction when the light of Jesus Christ shines into people's lives. There we read at verse 19, Jesus says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness 
rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. I wonder if that possibly would keep someone, even in church this morning or someone watching online, is that what keeps you from coming to Christ, the light of the world, the saviour? Because doing so means acknowledging before God your sin. Sin that you love and cherish. Sin you don't really want to part with. You would rather not have that sin exposed as being evil or soul destroying because you imagine that all the good things you do in life, you see, in the end of the day will tip the balances in your favor and somehow cancel out the stuff that's not so good. Except that's not what the Bible teaches. Rather, the Bible teaches that a complete forgiveness and a complete deliverance from sin's curse and sin's power and sin's condemnation is possible when that sin is confessed to God, when our lives are given to Jesus Christ on the understanding that Christ will change our hearts and turn our lives around. What John is telling us here in verses 9 to 11 of chapter 1 is of how God's Savior was sidelined and rejected by two groups of people. Firstly, by the people of this world. That is those who in biblical terms here had no knowledge of the living God, their, their creator, because they had in their hearts and minds replaced the real God with their own idols and lived therefore in spiritual darkness. But secondly, he said, Jesus was being sidelined and rejected by his own people, the Jews. They hadn't lived in the same darkness because for centuries they had the privilege of receiving the light of God's word through the prophets who God sent to them. But each in their own way rejected the light of God in Jesus Christ. The one because they were blinded by their idolatry the other because they believed they did not need the light from God because their lives were so righteous and so good already. That's how it was, for example, with the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day. In their community, they were respected as men of God. They were respected as good men. And yet they set themselves against the one whom God sent to be their Messiah, their Savior. That's still how it is today, you know. Some people reject Christ in their obvious worldliness and their obvious love of sin. Others reject Christ in their religious self-righteousness who think they are good people, but their self-righteousness is itself a sin against God, the sin of a proud heart. But that, of course, is not the whole story because God did not send his son into the world merely to be sidelined and rejected, but because he had a plan to save sinners by working something miraculous in their hearts that was not of human origin. So in the next couple of verses of John 1, you see not a savior who was sidelined, but a saviour who is supreme. Look at verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Here is the incredible grace of God in action. The people who lived in rebellion against God, grieving God's heart, offending God's holiness by their sins, could actually be accepted by God in a whole new status as God's children. How could that be? 
Well, in the first instance, because the Savior who was despised and who was rejected, through that rejection, became the Savior who was sacrificed in death for the sake of sinners like you and like me. And then he became the Savior whom death could not defeat, who rose from the dead, and in rising brought to this world the promise of new life. And that new life in Christ really is the key to everything. Despite what people commonly imagine, everyone in the world is not God's child. I want to say that again. Everyone in the world is not God's child. Everyone in the world is God's creation. And as such, people are important to God. They matter to him. They are precious to him. They are loved by him. But the privilege of becoming God's children and enjoying the blessings of God's family belong only to those who receive God's Son as their Savior. Why we keep sidelining him and pushing him away, our lives remain in darkness. And that's where the devil would dearly want to keep us. God, however, has a plan, a purpose, and a power that is greater than that of the evil one. He has a power by which hearts that reject Christ can be changed into hearts that receive Christ. And that's what verse 13 is speaking of. It's speaking here of being born of God, a spiritual rebirth that no one else can give to us, that no one can work up within themselves, but it only comes to us through the Holy Spirit. And of course, you know very well, those of you who are familiar with John's gospel, that two chapters later, Jesus will encounter a, a religious man called Nicodemus. And the, the stunning thing that Jesus will say to this religious man, Nicodemus, is you must be born again. You need a new birth and a new heart. And that remains for every one of us, the essential experience that needs to take place in our hearts. Something that will break our love for sin. Something that will turn our hearts from simply loving ourselves to loving Jesus Christ more than anything else. That Jesus becomes the new love of our hearts. And it is then we will respond to Jesus in faith that saves us from the darkness and destruction of sin. I have many varied tastes in music. One person whose music I have occasionally listened to is a man called John Coltrane. Now you may never have heard of him and his music may certainly not appeal to your taste. John Coltrane died back in 1967 at the tragically young age of 40 years old. But he was one of the great jazz saxophonists of the 20th century. Very well known, certainly in America and across the world, he had many accolades to his name. But like all too many others who found fame in the world of entertainment, he had his demons in his own life that were destroying him. In his case, it was heroin addiction and alcoholism. That was something he struggled with over a period of at least seven years. Indeed, it was that substance abuse early in his life that probably contributed to his untimely death at such a young age. But quite apart from any therapy that he received for those addictions, something happened in 1957 that brought about a significant change in John Coltrane's life. He described it as, in this way. He says, by the grace of God, a spiritual awakening which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. And at that time in gratitude, I humbly ask to be given the means and the privilege to make others happy through music. So it was in 1964, he released what probably became his most famous musical composition, a suite of four pieces with this simple title, A Love Supreme. And on the album cover of that music he released at that time, he wrote at some length of his experience of God, 
He carried expressed praise for God's name. And he began with these words, I will do all I can to be worthy of thee, O Lord. It all has to do with that. Thank you, God. Now your experience and mine may be far removed from that of the heroin addict and alcoholic, John Coltrane. But your need, wherever you're coming from today, whatever life has thrown at you, is that you should come to know Jesus Christ, that you should know his love supreme. His love that not only brought him down from heaven to the lonely manger of Bethlehem, but that led him to the cross at Calvary where he died to save you from your sin. If you do not possess that love and that saving power of Jesus in your life, will you pray today that God's power will break into your life today and give you the new heart that you need to trust him as your own saviour and Lord. Let's pray. Lord, may you come in your grace and mercy and mighty saving power to change someone's life this Christmas Sunday so that this Christmas is about so much more than any Christmas that's gone before. Not just about songs and presents and family visiting for Christmas dinner, but a new heart, a new love, a love supreme for Jesus Christ as our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's finish with this Carl O Little Town of Bethlehem.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us today and forevermore. Amen.